In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome, my brothers and sisters in Christ, on this 16th day of the month of September in the year of our Lord, 2023. I would like to address, with respect to the writings of the servant of God, Louisa, dictated to her by Jesus Christ, by the Virgin Mary, and by saints, the theme that pertains to these end times in which we live, and that is the general state of confusion in the world and in the church, that leads to the fulfillment of the Our Father prayer, namely, the reign of God's will on earth as in heaven. The writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, imply that there will be a confusion and explicitly state that this is part of the childbearing pain, so to speak, before the church gives birth. Like the Blessed Mother did to the Lord, though she was exempt from all labor pains because she was conceived without sin. And this general confusion is found in volume 12, January 29th, 1919, where Jesus reveals to Louisa, now we have arrived at approximately the third 2,000 years. And there will be a third renewal. This is the reason for the general confusion, which is nothing other than the preparation for the third renewal. And if in the second renewal, I manifested what my humanity did and suffered, and very little of what my divinity was accomplishing, now in this third renewal after the earth will be purged and a great part of the current generation destroyed, I will be even more generous with creatures. I will accomplish this renewal by manifesting what my divinity did within my humanity. I will manifest how my divine will cooperated with my human will. How everything remained linked within me, how I did and redid everything, and how even each thought of every soul was done by me and sealed with my divine will. My love wants to pour itself out. It wants to make known to what excess my divinity went when operating in my humanity for love of souls. The excess that greatly surpasses that which my humanity operated externally. This is also why I often speak to you about living in my will, which I have not manifested to anyone until now. At best, others have known but a pale shadow of my will, that is, the grace and the sweetness of doing it. But to penetrate inside of it, to embrace its immensity, to be multiplied with me and while on earth, to penetrate everywhere, both in the heavens and in hearts on earth, laying down the human ways and acting in divine ways, this is not yet known. Indeed, not a few will this to those Will this appear strange? And those who do not keep their minds open to the light of truth will not understand a thing. 
but little by little I will make my way into their hearts, manifesting one moment one truth, another moment another truth about living in my will, so that they will eventually understand it. In this passage here, the Lord is reminding us of why he permits, why God permits the confusion that we presently experienced, even at the hands of evildoers. Certainly, it is in part the result of our collective sinfulness. And this collective sinfulness that is instigated by the devil, who works through sin in man, is part of God's divine providence. God doesn't will evil, but he permits it, as he did original sin, as he did the rebellion of the angels, for ultimately a greater good, but only for those who love him and seek to live in his will. Now, the result of good, the Satan's activity in these end times through confusion leads to chastisements. And that is why the Lord said in this third renewal, when the earth is purged, God will reveal what his divinity did within his humanity. When he speaks of the earth being purged, he's referring to chastisements. And the wizard beheld in mystical vision that the earth will be purged and mankind in large part destroyed, meaning kill their bodies, not their souls, and purified through fire. Peter speaks about this as well in his second letter. He speaks of three renewals also, St. Peter when he speaks of three heavens and three earths. St. Peter states that the first heavens and earth were done away with on account of the deluge, the flood. And that's when God appeared in the sky as a rainbow, the presence of God's blessing upon mankind. And God promised he would never flood the earth again in that way. So we are living in the second heavens and second earth, following the flood. And these second heavens and second earth, St. Peter states, are reserved for fire. And when the fire comes, the earth will be purged, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Fire will come from the center of the earth, Louisa relates in volume 2, August 2nd, 1899. Fire will come from the center of the earth. What is that? The earth's core. And we find also in volume 8, January 2nd, 1909, volume 11, October 27th, 1922, the same teaching. That fire will come from the core of the earth. But not just from the earth. Remember what Our Lady prophesied at Akita, Japan, which was approved by the church? That fire will fall also from the sky sparing neither laity nor priests. The good will suffer with the bad, the living will envy the dead. The same teaching is found also in Louisa's volume, 14, September 1st, 1922. And it's also found in volume 12, November 2nd, 1917, volume 6, October 20th, 1905, and volume 11, April 3rd, 1915, fire falls from the sky and at the same time from the core of the earth to overwhelm mankind and make him believe that God exists. Volume 2, October 7th, 1899. Now this fire will strike first and foremost evildoers and those who are good and live a life of simplicity will be spared. This is found in volume two, August 2nd, I'm sorry, August 10th, 1899. 
And the fire that descends upon earth will damage crops and mankind's nourishment. Found in volume four, April 22nd, 1901. And May 22nd, 1902. And this fire will flare up in countries. This is found in volume three, July 30th, 1900. Further purging the earth and man is the sword that represent wars, which we see happening today. This is found in volume four, March 22nd, 1901, and revolutions. Volume 16, March 22nd, 1924. And there are other forms of chastisement, fire, sword, and blood. Water also will spill out of its boundaries, not as in the days of Noah covering all generations, the entire generation of that time, but impacting nations, certain nations, not all. And wind will spill out of their boundary to destroy part of humanity and bury man, volume seven, April 17th, 1906. And other passages, volume 11, volume 16, the winds, the waters, fire, will all concur in purging the earth, in getting rid of all evildoers. While those who live in God's divine will will have dominion over these elements. This is found in volume 8, January 3rd, 1922. Louisa also speaks of a black fire and blood that appears to represent a comet. In volume two, March 14th, 1899, peals of thunder and lightning, a terrible hail, earthquakes that annihilate entire cities. It's found in volume 13, December 22nd, 1921, and other passages like volume 17, volume 19, and so forth. So. I got a little noise that just came in and I don't even know where it came from. But uh, There will be sudden deaths, there will be contagions. So Louisa, in a way, foresaw what we experience with COVID. She speaks of contagious diseases in volume 12, October 16th, 1918. But in the end, the nations will turn back to God. That is the remnant survivors, which in sacred scripture is more, no, no more than one third of humanity. So two thirds will be destroyed by these means. Now this introduces the book of Revelation, the times in which we're living right now. The book of Revelation talks about the evil of Satan through sin in the world, generating a confusion that God avails himself of without condoning. And leads to through purgation, illumination, unification and divinization. In the book of Revelation, St. John, who penned that book at Patmos, talks of the world's future in Revelation 12, 3 and 4. Chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. As well as in verse 17, St. John beholds a huge red dragon in the sky. That's the devil. And in Revelation 13, he beholds two beasts. One emerges from the sea with ten horns and seven heads and the other from the earth with two horns. He reveals that the seven heads of the first beast represent seven kings who reign over seven kingdoms, five of whom have fallen in John's lifetime. One is present in his lifetime and the seventh kingdom has yet to come. That is in our lifetime, that's happening now. The seventh kingdom is popularly known and quoted by politicians as a new world order. 
which is also found in Latin on the back of the dollar bill. Now, one discovers also in the book of Daniel similar iterations that are found in St. John's book of Revelation. For example, Daniel chapter 7, where this holy prophet beholds four beasts from the sea that represent four kingdoms, which, as I mentioned, St. John reveals have already fallen. So while the characteristics of the four beasts of Daniel and kings who govern kingdoms of St. John are similar, they represent kingdoms in different historic times. In the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, this prophet describes the characteristics of the four beasts as follows. Number one, the lion. Daniel has a vision of the lion. Or the king does, and then Daniel, of course, interprets it, which represents the Neo-Babylonian Empire, of which Nebuchadnezzar was king. The bear, another kingdom, which represents the Medo-Persian Empire, of which Cyrus was king. The leopard, which represents the Greek Empire, of which Alexander was king. And fourth, the terrifying, horrible beast, which represents the Roman Empire of which Julius Caesar was king. Now this is manifest in Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 to 33, where he affirms in quotes, in your vision, O king, he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar, you saw a statue very large and exceedingly bright, terrifying in appearance as it stood before you. The head of the statue was pure gold, its chest and arms were silver, its belly and thighs bronze, the legs iron and its feet partly iron, partly tile. Daniel informs King Nebuchadnezzar that he, the king, is the head of gold of the Neo-Babylonian Empire that reigned from 626 to 539 BC at the time of Daniel. He states to the king, you, O king, to you the God of heaven has given dominion and strength, power and glory. Men, wild beasts, and birds of the air, wherever they may dwell, he has handed over to you, making you ruler over them all, and you are the head of gold. Daniel then reveals to the same king that the statue he beheld had not only a pure gold head, but silver chest and arms, thus foretelling the fall of the Babylonian empire into the hands of the Medes and Persians. So he tells King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 5, verse 28, Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. That's the Medo Persian Empire. Of the statue, the Medes represent the chest and the Persians represent the arms. And the Medo Persian Empire reigned immediately after, in fact, in the same year as the fall of the Babylonian Empire. So you go from the Neo Babylonian Empire, 626 to 539 BC, to the Medo Persian Empire, 539 BC to 331 BC, over which reigned Cyrus II. Now let us recall that after Judah was taken into captivity at this time, Babylonian captivity, Babylon ruled the promised land under Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon later fell to the Medo Persian Empire, which then became sovereign over Jerusalem and the promised land. And because of the vassal status, the Jewish captives that returned from Babylon after its fall had to ask permission from Cyrus, the king of the Medo Persian Empire and Darius, the Persian kings, both of them, to rebuild the wall and the temple. So the Jews enjoyed a measure of peace in this time. Thanks to Cyrus the Liberator, who brought them back from Babylon. But their freedom depended on the favor of the ruling Persian Empire and emperor. So the Medo persia kingdom reigned over the Jewish nation for more than 200 years from the overthrow of Babylon in 539 BC until Medo-Persia itself was defeated by 
the Greeks, the third kingdom that Daniel speaks of in 331 BC, when the Greeks overthrew the Medo-Persian Empire. In the eighth chapter, the angel Gabriel reveals to Daniel the meaning of a vision in which he beheld a two-horned ram. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. Gabriel tells Daniel, the two-horned ram you saw represents the kings of the Medes and Persians, unquote, which were defeated by a male goat in Daniel chapter 8, verse 21, which is the Greek kingdom. So he adds, the angel Gabriel to Daniel, the he-goat, is the king of the Greeks. And the great horn on its forehead is the first king. So the bronze belly and thighs of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar beheld and that Daniel explained to him represents the Greek empire that reigned from 323 to 146 BC, over which Alexander the Great reigned. And the statue's iron legs of feet of partially iron and partially clay represent the Roman Empire that reigned during St. John's lifetime when he wrote this book of Revelation. And that came hundreds of years after Daniel's vision, or rather King Nebuchadnezzar's vision and Daniel's interpretation that would succeed the Greeks as depicted in the fourth beast of Daniel's vision, chapter 7. After Alexander the Great, king of the Greeks, conquered the Middle Persian Empire, the Greeks became the new overseers of the land, the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. And the Jews under the Maccabees, if you recall the last book of the Old Testament, gained a measure of independence until Rome took control of the area, the Roman Empire. Thus, during the time of Christ, the Jewish people of the Old Testament ecclesia lived in the land and worshipped in the second temple while it was under Roman jurisdiction. And this really began in 63 BC when Pompey, the Roman general Pompey, captured the promised land and the Roman Empire occupied it for about 700 years. These are the four beasts reported in the book of Daniel that are similar to the beasts that St. John beheld and reported in his book of Revelation that I mentioned earlier in chapters 12, 17, 13. St. John's chapters 12, 13, 17 describe the vision of a red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Seven kings who reign over seven kingdoms. Two beasts, one from the earth, one from the sea. Seven diadems, seven hills. Now these imageries are not to be taken literally, obviously. They symbolize kingdoms that are not good. That are under the power of Satan, who uses men to carry out his evil works. In sacred scripture, the expression hills, St. John talks about seven hills, or mountains represent governmental structures or kingdoms. And wherever there is a kingdom, there is a king. For this reason, those who claim that the seven hills of the book of Revelation refer to Rome, pervert the sacred text. They're trying to literally apply this, and this is not what John had in mind. When St. John's book of Revelation was penned, in, in particular chapters 13, 17, describing the vision of a beast that has seven heads, kings, that represent seven hills, kingdoms, five of which have fallen, he is referring to kingdoms of the past. These kingdoms include Daniel's 
four kingdoms. The lion, the bear, the leopard, and the terrifying horrible beast, which is the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. And St. John adds that one kingdom has yet to come in Revelation 17. And that is what we're experiencing in these end times. Historically, there were five kingdoms that had fallen at the time in which St. John wrote the book of Revelation. And these were, number one, the Egyptian Empire. Remember Moses? Liberating the people of God from Egyptian slavery. There was the Egyptian Empire under Pharaoh. There was the Assyrian Empire. There was then the four kingdoms Daniel speaks of. The Neo-Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, the Roman. And then St. John adds that one kingdom has yet to come. Five have already fallen, one still lives, and the last has yet to come. Now, Before I get into this last kingdom, let me address the meaning behind these symbolic imageries that John speaks of. Revelation 12, chapter, verse 3, a red dragon appears in the sky. This is Lucifer. Why the sky? Remember what Jesus said? I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. Now the question is, where did he land? Obviously it was here on earth. Because we find him on roaming the earth in the book of Job. And the angel speaks to Satan and says, what are you doing? He says, oh, just roaming the earth, patrolling it, looking for someone. And St. Mark says, Satan is like a roaring lion roaming the earth, looking for someone to devour. Resist him solid in your faith. So Satan was cast down from heaven to the earth. But remember, Satan is a spirit. He doesn't have a body. So he can multi-locate, just like hauntings in houses. They're not confined to one place. Spirits can multi-locate, good and bad spirits. And this red dragon, Lucifer, appears in the sky because he's in the act of falling. And he is known in scripture as Satan, the devil, the dragon, the ancient serpent, the adversary, and so forth. He is the evil spirit imbuing and empowering all of the pagan kingdoms, known as the beast, to wage war against Christ and his church. The seven heads are kingdoms, and the ten horns are its kings that work under the diabolical authority of Satan. Now, with respect to the last kingdom of which St. John writes, and that has yet to come, it is argued that this kingdom is currently being formed today through the apostatized Western allied nations. that are presently pursuing the creation of what is referred to as a great reset. To lead to a new world order, a one world government, and these expressions are used again by public figures in politics. So these are not conspiracies, these are facts. By the way, do you know where the concept of conspiracy theory came from, who created it? I will mention that three-letter institution of our government, but that's where it came from. And this so-called new world order is under the rule of a tyrannical world global leadership and their adepts. And this last kingdom of which St. John speaks is to wield power and influence far greater than its predecessors. For example, this is corroborated by the 4th century St. Ephraim, the 4th century St. Cyril of Jerusalem, 
and St. John Chrysostom. And the fourth and fifth century, St. Jerome, who were all of whom refer to a world government in the future as the Roman Empire come back to life. If you want more information in this regard, I refer you to my book that reports their quotations and their sources entitled Antichrist and the End Times. You can find it on the website livinginthedivineworld.org. Antichrist and the End Times. Now, that which distinguishes the late Roman Empire from its future revival under a new world order is its having for the first time established dominion upon the entire earth, even to its ends. How? Through technology. Through technology. Technology in itself is not evil, but Satan will avail himself of it to try to convince the masses of a great diabolical lie that has been preserved for these end times and that will emerge soon. And that lie is that God did not create us, but other beings did from other worldly areas. And St. John affirms that this last kingdom and its adepts will not, will only for a short period of time succeed in imposing the penalty of death on those who refuse its mark, thereby changing its so-called acts of government into acts of war and terror on all Christians. Now, the original word in Greek for mark, John speaks of a mark, is karagma, karagma, which does not mean mark at all, but more forcefully, a strike that leaves an impression like a brand in a cow, for example. It's a brand within the flesh. And this Luciferian mark that John speaks of may be impressed within the flesh of the right hand or forehead as a public declaration and will demand of those civilians who receive it customary public acts of worship. Acts of public worship will be directed toward an image that will be erected in honor of the one world conglomerate beast. St. John talks about this. And according to St. John, Satan will empower this image to come to life, as it were. Now, it won't have a literal life like we do, a conscience, a rationality, a volition, no. But aided by technology, artificial intelligence, for example, this is very plausible. With, not without the diabolical mechanizations, of course, in addition to technology. But in these short but dark days ahead, there will be little wiggle room for pusillanimous individuals who expect to receive this Luciferian mark solely to obtain material goods, to survive. Why? The one who receives the mark, St. John reveals, this mark of the beast, he calls it, have consented to idolatry. Idolatry and henceforth are targeted by God's angels for the day of the Lord, the day of wrath, that will manifest itself quickly and with great violence. The book of Revelation reveals their fate. Chapter 16, verse 2 states, The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, festering in ugly sores, broke out on those who had the mark of the beast or worshipped his image. Unquote. Now, those who have refused this mark, whatever it is, will be put to the test, but divine assistance will give them strength. This anti-Christian world government will force them, if they wish to worship openly, into hiding where they will pray and receive the sacraments from bishops, priests, clandestinely, or in cynicals, and God's angels will seal them on the forehead to protect them from his wrath. This is found in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4 and 14, verse 1. A spiritual divine seal will be imprinted on their foreheads. The foreheads of those that refuse the mark of the beast to guard them, guard them and equip them to endure the seven trumpets. 
Now, this last kingdom of which I'm addressing will espouse a communist ideology to further Satan's plan to destroy God's church and stifle all promptings of the Holy Spirit in the souls of his children. This last kingdom will assuage humanity's desire for religion by delivering to the masses as opium an idol, a god, false god that appeals to all religions. By the working of diabolical wonders aided by technology, this final kingdom will mesmerize the masses and win over many. Yves Saint Jean Saint John says, if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. We will know that this kingdom is of Satan. Why? Because of its characteristics, which are number one, removing the perpetual sacrifice of which Daniel and John spoke. The Eucharist will be halted, at least in public, for several years. So there were, there's a period of seven years mentioned in the book of Revelation as a period of tribulation. And the end part of it, the last three and a half years, is the worst. And that's when the Eucharist will be abolished. And the public exercise of the papacy will be suppressed. The papacy will always exist, even underground, as it has at the time of the catacombs when the Christians were being martyred, but it won't be permitted in public. Satan wants all authority, and he will stop at nothing until he gets it. But God has foreseen that even though Satan will have his hour, God will have his day. There can be no resurrection without a crucifixion. There can be no Easter without a Good Friday. There can be no reign of God's will on earth without Satan having his will reign on earth. And we are living in those times. And the third characteristic of this evil conglomerate kingdom is it will replace with a false substitute religion. This man of iniquity of which St. Paul speaks of in his second letter to the Thessalonians, the abomination of desolation, the man of lawlessness, he, hestekota, is a third person singular word in Greek, meaning he will sit himself. This is a male individual, often referred to as the Antichrist by the church fathers, will sit himself in the throne of God in Declare himself God. Now, this is not the throne of the Vatican, no. This is a counterfeit church. It will most likely be a prominent parliament place. And he will proclaim himself God. This tyrannical rule imposed by this last kingdom will deny the resurrection and the divinity of Jesus Christ. So there are five characteristics right there. The removal of the Eucharist, of the public exercise of the papacy, even though the papacy will continue to exist. God will never leave his flock untended, but it will be under persecution. There will be this false, iniquitous, anti-Christian human male that will declare himself God. There will be who will deny the resurrection and the divinity of Christ. And six, the sixth characteristic, this kingdom and its anti-Christian male individual leader will change the church's sacred tradition. He won't change the church, no, but he will create a counterfeit black church of which St. Catherine, Anne, blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich speaks. And this black, she calls it a black counterfeit church, meaning dark, evil, sinister, won't have anything to do with the Catholic church because he will crunch, he will suppress the Catholic church. One of the mistakes those who are not conversant in sacred scripture often make is that when they read the book of Revelation, they apply it to the Vatican, they apply it to Rome, and this is wrong. They're completely off the mark. Satan wants nothing to do with the Vatican or Rome. He wants world dominion. And he wants all authority, even papal authority, which he cannot possess. But he wants authority over the moral consciousness of humans. This is part of the communist ideology. There's no freedom of religion, no freedom of consciousness. You can't speak freely. You can't worship freely. The devil wants to control everything. 
aided by technology. But God won't allow it. He will allow him to have his hour for a little while to test us, and we deserve the testing because of our iniquities. But that will yield a great fruit for those who withhold their patience and withstand the evil. So this tyrannical last kingdom will deny freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech. And those who refuse to serve this anti-Christian world order, last kingdom, seventh kingdom, will be unable to buy or sell anything. Meaning technology will prohibit them from doing so. St. John reveals this when he speaks of a, the beast forced all people small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a stamped image on their right hand or their foreheads so that no one could buy or sell anything except the one who had the stamped image of the beast's name and the number that stood for its name. And that number, you know, literally, the name Caesar comes out to numerically in Hebrew numerical value, 666 is, again, not to be taken as a literal number, but a numerical value number that comes from the name Caesar, meaning emperor. That's what 666 means, an evil world emperor in charge of an evil, evil world empire or kingdom. And insofar as this last kingdom is in, intimately linked to the society, the dark societies that are festering in the world today which eight popes have condemned. They represent in modern times the various lodges that seek to undermine God's grace, which is communicated by means of the seven sacraments. So this last kingdom's aim is not to deny God like the old communist, the communist movement that was crushed in officially in 1991 when Russia's doors opened up. And now, of all people, Russia, is defending Christian rights more than him, the Western world is. What an irony. Ever since Pope John Paul II consecrated Russia in 1984, and Lucia, the last living seer of Fatima, said that it was accepted by Mary and fulfilled her requests within four years, the dissolution of Russia happened. 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall. 1991, its official dissolution. And now Russia is growing in Christian faith and morals. People are more fervent than ever in the East now. I'm not saying Russia is a saint yet, but Our Lady said in Medjugorje, Russia will glorify God the most in the end. And it's happening, starting already. Now, the church has a function that educates us and keeps us on the straight and narrow that, and that function is known as the magisterium. And the magisterium extends to certain prophetic revelations, what's called a seal of approval, whether it's in the form of the imprimatur in Hilabstadt. And when an imprimatur is given to a work, it's a guarantee that it may be printed and displayed and sold in churches and nothing is in there contrary to faith and morals. Why do I mention this? Because the late priest, my my good friend, I met him and was at mass with him. And he passed away several years ago, Father Stefano Gobi from Italy, northern Italy. He received revelations from Mary that have received the church's official seals of approval, the imprimatur. Now, some people are colored in their discernment of Father Gobi because of the year 2000, where there was a message saying the great, by the end of the great Jubilee, there will come to fulfillment, everything that was stated at Fatima, etc. And when it didn't happen, they said, oh, he was wrong. Well, that's not exactly what he meant. Again, it's a, how you interpret the message, just like scripture, that's to be interpreted in the right way. What happened is that by the great Jubilee, of which Saint Pope John Paul II wrote over and over again in his encyclical, and in his apostolic letters, when he spoke of a third millennium of unifications, the threshold of the third millennium, he said, Pope John Paul II, who's now a saint and called the great, that that's when 
the beginning of the end begins, meaning the birth pangs. That's what Father Gogu is referring to. Victory is already here in potentiality. It's already begun in actuality. The beginning starts with labor pains. The beginning of birth starts with labor pains in a sinful body conceived in sin. And that is what the church is. And these seven heads of which St. John speaks in his book of Revelation, Father Ogobi addresses. And he talks of them as being, I'm also lodges that seek to undermine God's grace that's communicated through the sacraments. And unlike communism that denied God, these secret societies blaspheme him, they don't deny him. And Satan avails himself of these tyrannical leaders and adepts of this seventh bad kingdom to govern the world by means of ten horns. And the horn in biblical iterations is an instrument of amplification, a way of generating news of propaganda. And the diadems on these horns represent signs of dominion and royalty to those who bend to the evil principles of this evil society and its rules, denying Christ's divinity, resurrection, suppressing the Eucharist, the exercise of the public papacy and contradicting God's traditions and so forth. Now, it's important to note that if in these end times, subversive force and high positions of secular authority impose ungodly laws under Satan's authority, God does not leave his flock untended. He opposes the authority of Satan and his adepts with his own divine authority through his prophets. Every generation is given a prophet since the time of Adam. There's never been a generation without one. Unfortunately, as I mentioned in my last talk, the church is lagging here. If you study theology, there is no branch or discipline on prophecy. Why is that? When prophecy is one of the most important functions in the entire church. St. Paul lists prophecy as the second most important function in the church. And there in theology is no discipline on studying prophecy. Thanks to Melchior Cano, a Spanish Dominican who said all prophecy ended with Christ. And this is wrong. Even Cardinal Ratzinger said it was a wrong teaching. But unfortunately, it crept in a lot of Catholic schools, seminaries, novitiate houses. And seminarians are taught that we don't need to know anything about prophecy because it ended with Christ. And this is false. But God's divine authority is always extended to us through the prophets. God doesn't do anything without the prophets. And Louisa is a prophet. We call her a mystic because... It undermines the importance of prophecy, but she is a prophet. Faustina was a prophet. Margaret Mary was a prophet. The Blessed Mother is the, uh, is the second of greatest prophet after Christ, who appears and is appearing throughout the world today. Without prophecy, there's no church. Why do you think Elijah appeared beside Christ along with Moses at the moment of transfiguration to make a statement? He represents prophecy and Moses represents the law. This apparition of Christ between Moses and Elijah was a statement that the church will never be without the law and the prophets. And St. Paul tells us why God is allowing this general confusion in these end times. Why God is permitting it for a greater good, for those who love him, that is. Those who hate him, it doesn't turn out to be a greater good, now does it? They end up in eternal hell. Paul states that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more in Romans 5.20. Where sin abounds, and boy does it abound today, grace abounds all the more at the same time. And this is how Father Gobi's statement is to be interpreted. That by the end of the Jubilee year, the fulfillment is present. Because while sin is abounding, grace is abounding at the same time. It's not like there's sin and then grace follows, no. 
grace happens concomitantly with sin. Certainly it intensifies when Satan is thrown into the pit for a thousand years, that symbolic long period of time that John speaks about in the book of Revelation. And two recent pontiffs, Saints Pope John Paul the twenty third, Saint John the twenty third, and John Paul the second, spoke of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these end times, this new Pentecost. As early as the sixties, this was being mentioned by the Pope. Saint Pope John the twenty third proclaimed this truth vigorously in his introductory remark at the Second Vatican Council when he stated, "The Church needs a new Pentecost." In all Catholic churches throughout the world, these words are prayed in preparation for the Second Vatican Council. Renew your wonders in our midst as in a new Pentecost, unquote. And Pope John Paul II proclaimed to Latin America in 1992, welcome the spirit so that a new Pentecost may take place in every community, 1992. And this outpouring of the third person of the Trinity is abundantly evident in the church approved writings of scores of contemporary prophets, especially Luisa Picaretta, who emphasizes how God permits Satan to have his hour in order to prepare the world for the day of the Lord and a universal era of peace, a universal era of peace. Our Lady spoke of this at Fatima also. She said, many nations will be destroyed, but in the end, I will give the world an era of peace and my immaculate heart will triumph. This is the reign of God's will on earth. It's the reward for those who hold fast to the traditions of the church, to sacred scripture, to the magisterium. Has God the Father allowed Satan to test his son in the desert? So he permits Satan to test the loyalty of his children. He does this to increase their merit and bestow upon them the enthrallments of eternal beatitude. And last but not least, thank you for tuning in to this program, Radio Maria. I encourage all of you to continue to support this commercial free and listener supported program and to pray for me. And I rest assured that I will pray for you. We pray for each other, and this is how the church is sanctified, by mutual love. May God bless you and keep you always united with his most holy will. For where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.